Good afternoon and welcome to the Western Association for College Admission Counseling Virtual College Fair. Thank you so much for joining us. Just a couple of announcements before we get started. You can use the Q&A button on your screen to type questions to our presenters at any time. Your camera and microphone are turned off so the panelists won't be able to see or hear you. The Q&A feature is really the only way you have of interacting with the panelists. Also, this is just one of many different sessions happening today. So if you haven't already, be sure to sign up for some additional college fair sessions later in the afternoon. Also this session, as well as all the other panels and college fair presentations are being recorded and will be available within about a week uh, online at strivescan.com slash WACAC. Again, strivescan.com WACAC, same place where you registered for this. And now I'd like to turn it over to our panelists, Jessica and Lisa who will be uh, talking to you about uh, applying to college in California. Thanks, Josh. I'm gonna transition to do some screen sharing. So bear with me for a second. All right. Um, so my name is uh, Jessica Green and I am an admissions officer at UC San Diego. So thank you all for joining us today to learn more about the UC NCSU application process. I'll let my colleague introduce herself. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us at this Springs Fair. Uh, my name is Lisa Rubio. I'm Director of Admissions Operations out at Cal State San Bernardino. And so today we'll talk to you about navigating both the UC and the Cal State application process. So to get started, we're gonna talk a little bit about um, our campuses in general. So the University of California system has um, undergraduate campuses across California. So you can see this map here um, shows uh, where they're located everywhere from our northest point with UC Davis and our most southern with UC San Diego where I am located. So the UC's mission is to um, teach, uh, provide research as well as public service um, for the um, state and people of California. And each campus is unique. Um, so they have different student bodies, different vibes, and different opportunities with different majors as well. Um, so uh, the application process the same application for the University of California, but we all review it independently um, as well. So that's a little bit about some of the California campuses for UC. And here's a map of our beautiful state here with 23 California State University campuses. So we range in size and area from Humboldt in the north all the way to San Diego State in the south. Um, in between, there's very different types of campuses. There's large campuses such as Cal State Northridge, Long Beach State, and then there's very small campuses like Cal State Channel Islands. Um, I'm right now at a, at a mid-size or medium campus with about 22,000 students. So it varies depending on location and area. There's a difference in both majors. And like Jessica mentioned, really the fill of the campus, if it's commuter based, if it's very residential. Um, so you'll really have to look at campus tours, websites to get a good feel for each one. Each campus is unique. The CSU is very undergraduate heavy. We do offer master's degrees, but the only um, educational doctorate program or PhD level programs are at very few campuses and it's only um, EDD or very few PhD programs. Everything else is very undergraduate based and master's level. So we're gonna go over for you the college preparatory pattern or the A through G requirements to be eligible for both the Cal State and the UC. We do have very few differences, but for the most part, we use the same chart, same website in order to view what counts as an A through G appropriate high school level class. So you'll need to make sure um, you're talking to your counselor and following this chart as you begin both freshman year and then sophomore year and continue on. So you can see the limit on here for years. Now these are minimum suggestions, except for English, that's every year. These are minimum suggestions. You can always go over and earn um, additional points based on where you're applying but you're looking at world history, four years of English, three years of math, and that goes through at least algebra two. So anything beyond that would be great. Science with the lab, this is one of the areas where I think the UC and the Cal State differ. Um, the Cal State requires one year of physical and one year of biological science completely separate with the lab. Uh, language other than English, it does need to be the same language across both years. So you can't do one year of French, one year of Spanish, it needs to be the same language across both. 
And then a visual performing arts. I have to check with Jessica if it's approved for it to be two semesters, but I know at the Cal State they've approved it this last year so that it can come from two different semesters of a VPA and then electives. Um, so the next slide will show you where and how you check what's an A through G approved course at your high school. Yes, so you could do visual performing arts uh, half a uh, semester for each, um, that would be fine. Um, and as Lisa mentioned, these are the minimum um, course requirements that is suggested for the UC and the CSU system to be admitted as a first year, uh, first time freshman applicant. Okay, so how do you find out if your course at your high school is A through G approved or appropriate? Um, we both use the UCOP or what used to be the doorway site. And here's the website right here. <clears throat> you'll click right here where it says A through G course list, where it's highlighted in red. And you'll search for your high school. As long as it's California high school, then it will be listed there. And depending on the year that you've taken the class, you'll be able to select. And it's a little hard to see, but there's a dashboard right going across the top that has the years listed. Once you click on that, you'll see every course that's A through G approved per area for your high school. So you can sit with your counselor, your parents, or just sit with your transcript and review what on your transcript is eligible as an A through G. As long as it's on there, then it's approved. Okay, so I'll be talking with you about the California State University from the freshman level, a little bit about transfer toward the end, but mostly about how you qualify to be a first time applicant. So the CSU is pretty unique as in we have what's called impaction or campus impaction. You'll hear that a lot when you're looking to apply or you're reviewing campuses for the Cal States. And in general, what that means is just that we have more applications than we can accommodate for either that class level or that program. And so with impaction, there's higher criteria that's, that needs to be met in order to qualify for the program. There's three types of categories for impaction. So you can be looking at a campus that's just CSU minimum, meaning they'll admit with minimum CSU requirements, regardless of the area that you're coming from, or major that you're applying to. There's also campus impaction for either freshmen or transfers where either of those classes may have more applications. And so you'll need to meet higher requirements, whether you're a freshman or a transfer. And then there's campuses that are impacted in all majors and programs. So I'll show you right now, similarly, what that looks like so you can understand um, what needs to be met and how that works. Okay, so this chart breaks down for you, and this is based on last year. So the list on the left is showing you who is using CSU minimum eligibility. That means any of these campuses on the left, Bakersfield, Channel Islands, et cetera, you can meet minimum requirements for a CSU and you're eligible. So you should be offered admission. Campuses in the middle column there, they're impacted at the freshman level. I mean, if you're if you're applying as a first year student, you need to meet higher requirements, regardless of which area or major you're applying to. And so it depends on, um, oops, it depends on what you're looking at in terms of campus size and then how your GPA is after that. <clears throat> and then there's campuses on the right where we're impacted in all programs and areas. So for instance, Fresno State, Cal State Fullerton, Long Beach State, you're applying and competing per program and not necessarily um, per your entrance or location. So you'll need to also meet higher requirements. So you'll need to do some research on your campuses to find out. It's a good idea to do a mixture of campuses and definitely include some of the non-impacted. So the list on the left, if that's especially your local area, you'll want to include some of those so that way at least you're guaranteed some offers. The Cal State does do redirection for freshmen that are not admitted um, to their campus, you know, first choice campus that they're applying to. So meaning, say you apply to Long Beach State and you are a CSU eligible student, but you don't meet impaction criteria, you will get redirected to another campus. And so some other campus that can take you that has space will offer you admission later in the term. So that's a possibility as well. Next slide. Okay, so how do you calculate your grade point average? 
this is a very general chart. I know that things have changed this last year due to COVID, and there may be a lot of students that did pass fail or credit, no credit. So you'll really have to work with your counseling staff to make sure you're calculating your GPA correctly. Ninth grade, um, you do need to take and pass your A through G courses with a C or better, but it's not used to calculate toward your GPA. So it's really just you getting acclimated to high school, passing your A through Gs, but we don't start calculating the GPA until 10th grade. And so 10th grade um, and 11th grade is really where the bulk of your GPA comes from because when you apply in your senior year, you don't have grades quite yet. So senior year will keep you admitted, but it won't necessarily get you admitted. That's 10th and 11th grade. So at the end of your junior year, you can really calculate where you're at and that's how you'll know um, what your A through G GPA is. Uh, the points on the bottom, that's for honors and AP. Generally, it's 11th grade honors and AP classes where we can offer up to eight points additional um, credit. That's only per semester. So if it's a full year AP class, then that's two additional grade points. So you'll get a max of eight, regardless of how many AP or honors classes you took, the max will be eight. Next slide. And first time freshman admission requirements for the CSU. This is the general list. Of course, you'll have to check per major if you're applying to say music and auditions required or some other program, dance that needs um, higher requirements, portfolios, et cetera. But just basic admission criteria for freshmen are completing all of your A through G college prep courses, C or better by the time you graduate from high school. Um, new this last year is the MFAS or multi-factor admission score. That's without test scores. So for COVID situation, we did not require SAT or ACT like in previous years where we had eligibility index. And so your GPA is combined with a list of attributes from your application in order to generate a multi-factor admission score for you. Um, you'll also need graduation from high school and then you'll need to meet campus or major impaction depending on where you apply. And so just a really quick note on the campus attributes. Those are very general questions that are coming from the application. It's simple drop down lists such as how many hours a week do you work, extracurricular um, activities, do you participate in educational programs. So it's a list that's being generated from the application. There's no extra criteria for you to complete in order for us to generate that score for you. And then here is the website to apply. It's called Cal State Apply. Um, so you'll hear that term often. Have you been on Cal State Apply? Have you generated your Cal State Apply login? You can do that at any point. You don't need to be an applicant. In fact, you can do it, you know, at any point, freshman year, sophomore year. So that way you can start reviewing campuses, looking at majors, doing comparisons. And um, that's a really good idea because you can start entering your coursework. So then senior year you go in and you already have some of that listed, listed there. So Cal State Apply opens each year October 1st and then it closes November 30th. And I'll show you a deadline um, chart coming up really quick just to uh, give some of the updates of what has changed this last year over COVID. But in general, it'll be October 1st to November 30th of each year. Okay, so here are the important dates. The application priority filing period, that's listed there. That's the typical year. We know that this last year was not typical and so many campuses chose to extend their application. Most of them extended to December 15th. A couple of campuses went out even further into January or February 1st. So you'll have to just keep on the websites and really look at where you're applying to see if there's gonna be extra time. Um, we're not anticipating any longer periods, but you know, we don't know. This last year was very unique. And so we had to extend application periods. Um, for FAFSA or the free application for federal student aid, that priority deadline is October 1st through March 2nd. And they've made it easier for a lot of parents to fill that out using your prior prior taxes from the year before. Um, that's a really good idea to get on that early and submit. The sooner you do, then the campus can start generating um, an award letter for you, which is really critical. And then EOP, the Cal States have uh, the Education Opportunity Program. I encourage you to really look at that if you're a first generation student or meet any of the income criteria on there. November 30th is in general the application deadline for EOP. 
but they have various letters of recommendation and statements that I believe they extend out to about the January timeline. So just check with each campus, check on there so that way you can get that um, submitted separately as well. I just wanted to point out that the timelines, the October 1st to March 2nd are also the same dates and deadlines for the California Dream Act application if you're going to be filling that out um, instead of the FAFSA. Yes, correct. Thank you, Jessica. For upper division transfers, so say you decide to come to CSU as a transfer instead of a first time freshman, we have a very high number of transfer students, so you are not alone if you're considering that option. Um, in general, what we're looking for, and it's similar to the freshman with impaction criteria, you're going to need to complete golden four courses, which is your speech class, English, critical thinking and math at a community college. You're going to need 60 minimum transferable requirements. And so working on that with a counselor is really critical because not every class at a community college is transferable. So similar to the A through G, you have an assist.org website for California community colleges that you'll need to be very carefully checking every class that you take to make sure you're following a pattern. So that way you are um, not wasting any extra time at a community college and can transfer over as quickly as possible. And then you'll need to meet the GPA requirement for the term. So if you come to us as a transfer rather than a freshman, we disregard any high school GPA. It's based off of your community college GPA at that point. So you'll need to do very strong, similar to high school, strong as possible, complete your requirements, and then apply to the program depending on what they're looking for. Okay, so some resources for you here. I really wanna highly encourage that you always start with your school counselor or career center. It's really critical. They, they get a lot of the updated information every year. Um, that's their role to really help you, you know, identify your GPA, where the programs are that you're looking for to help you um, match what a good campus may be. So really start there. That's a great benefit for you. Uh, every Cal State also has recruitment counselors in their offices of admissions or recruitment or outreach. So look for those. They do similar work for each campus. And so they'll be looking at talking with you about how to go through the application process, how to work through, you know, auditions or extra criteria or meet nursing requirements. So they can give you all the details for their campus, which is really useful. And then there's just some web information for you. So you can definitely go into the main calstate.edu website, but that's the general one for the 23 campuses. It's not gonna give you that great narrowed down information as if you go to every campus website. So for instance, if you're interested in Cal Poly, if you wanna go to San Luis Obispo, start with their website and really start to recruiters so that way you get the specific information for them. Because we all admit differently, there's gonna be very different requirements listed. There may be different deadlines. So you're gonna to wanna to really start at the campus website. And then of course, you can always access campuses via social media and just kind of see what content they're putting out. Usually it's deadline related information about programs, faculty. So that's always a good place to be as well. Well, we do have some questions that came into our Q&A box uh, while you were presenting. Um, so one of the questions uh, for the CSU, does zip code go into the MFAS calculation? Um, could you speak a little bit more about that? Uh, so let me see if I'm reading this right. So does zip code go? Okay, so location. Um, <laughs> technically, no. So it doesn't, it's not part of your calculation. Um, to, or, to understand how we view local and out of local for an impacted campus, it varies per campus. So for instance, um, my campus that I'm at now, we're impacted at five program levels, so only five majors, and then at the freshman and transfer level. So depending on where you're applying from, we have a list of local schools and they get first priority, meaning we have a lower GPA requirement for that group. Um, and then as space is filled, we go out further into our tier two, tier three, et cetera. But that's, that's our campus. Some campuses, it's very different. Um, and then campuses that are fully impacted, like a Fullerton or a Long Beach, it doesn't matter where you're coming from. Uh, it's based on program. And so you'll really have to check with each school. 
But yes, locality matters for impaction depending on the campus. And then uh, I think a question the whole group would want to know about is the class of 2022, um, our test score is going to be considered for the CSU application process. So this last year and next year, the guidelines were already given from the Cal State that we are um, we are not test optional. That's where you can use it for admission. We're actually test blind, meaning if a SAT or ACT is submitted, it can be used only for academic placement, but not for admission. So the multi-factor admission score is in place for this year, 21-22, as well as 22-23. And then we'll have another update before the next application cycle. Well, Lisa, with the time we have left, do, do you wanna take another Q&A um, question verbally and, and maybe do the rest uh, behind the scenes while I present? Sure, I can take one more. There's, I see one here that says, if you, what if you finished your two years of Spanish by the end of ninth grade? How will you, how will you see that if you only took only look at 10th and 11th. So A through G's, think of your A through G's as separate from your GPA. When we're doing an A through G check, it's to make sure that you meet all requirements. So if your freshman year, you pass Spanish two or Spanish three, then that validates all of the lower requirements. So your foreign language is done. And your GPA is coming again from A through G's, from 10th and 11th. So you may take chemistry, you may take other classes in there, but A through G's are a separate check from your GPA. Well, thanks for sharing all that information with us. Um, and uh, we are going to be chatting in the background to answer those unanswered questions in the Q&A box. Um, my name is Jessica, and I work for UC San Diego as an admissions officer. And I'm going to talk about um, the UC application process. So we're going to transition into UC. Um, so please use your chat box uh, to ask questions about the UC if you have any. Um, so we're going to do a quick overview of the UC application process first. So this slide right here has all of our dates and deadlines. So the University of California application is the application you would use for all of the University of California undergraduate campuses if you're applying as a first year student um, coming directly from high school um, or not having taken any college classes yet after high school graduation. So the first time application process, if you're gonna apply to maybe a UC Irvine or Berkeley or at UCLA, UC San Diego, um, we all use the same application. So the information you provide is gonna be used in your review process by each campus uh, separately. So the application will open for fall 2022 admission in August 1st. Um, so you'll be able to access the application and take a look at it starting August 1st. Between November 1st and November 30th, that's the submission time period. So there's 30 days to actually submit your UC application. Um, so you can start it on the 1st, but you're not gonna be able to submit it until November 1st, and you have to submit it by November 30th for fall 2022 admission. So then we notify students between February and March of their acceptances. Um, so typically for first year students, uh, acceptances uh, go out in mid-March um, and continue until the end of our March. And then for transfer students, we start admitting people, um, letting them know that they've been admitted um, usually in April. And then the May 1st is your intent to register. Um, so accepting your offer of admission. Uh, if you'd like to come to the campus that offered you that acceptance, you wanna do that by May 1st. If you were offered a position on the wait list, the wait list decisions for each University of California campus um, come out between May and the end of June. So that's a little bit about the timeline. So for minimum first year admission requirements and the application process, the University of California is also looking at your A through G courses that you've completed. And we understand because of COVID, you know, some of the classes you might have taken are pass or credit um, during that maybe spring 2020 semester or even beyond, um, but they can count through A through G. So then we look at your weighted GPA, which is your 10th and 11th grade weighted GPA. The courses you choose to take in ninth grade are important as well as the courses you choose to take in 10th, uh, 12th grade, but they're not calculated in your GPA for the University of California admission process. Um, so it's gonna be your 10th and 11th grade weighted GPA calculation. So for fall 2021 admission, we did not consider ACT or SAT test scores as a factor in the admissions process. For fall 2022 admission, the system has not made an announcement yet 
about um, not using test scores or not for fall 2022 admission. However, independently, campuses have made statements already. So some of the UCs have already said, we're not using test scores uh, for fall 2022 admission. So I would encourage you to look at each school's website, uh, social media accounts, um, to understand which campuses have already said that they are not gonna be using those test scores. Um, and which campuses have yet to make an announcement, um, really because we take the lead from the system of the University of California. So other factors that are can, can contribute to your admission um, process and review process is uh, factors that are listed here on the screen. So the rigor of the courses that you chose to take, um, maybe AP or IB or college level classes, honors and awards, special talents. There's just a ton of things that make you you, including the information you're gonna share in your personal insight questions. So our review process um, is a work of a comprehensive review um, in that we have the 13 review factors that we're looking at and each campus chooses to weigh those review factors differently. Um, so we really, with those personal insight questions, with the other information that we have, uh, get a full picture of who you are and your experiences. If you're interested in transfer admission, we've got the minimum requirements for transfer listed here on the screen. So um, you would need to acquire 60 UC transferable units. And as Lisa mentioned, we use the same website, assist.org. And if you're gonna be a transfer student and maybe attend one of our California community colleges, this is a very, very important website because you're able to review the classes that you think you wanna take at your community college and make sure that they are UC or CSU transferable uh, to get you to the minimum units needed. Um, we look for a competitive GPA from all of your college classes. Um, there are subject requirements. Um, so just as Lisa was mentioning with the golden um, requirements, we don't call those golden. We at the UC call them our seven course patterns. So there are six, I'm sorry, seven minimum classes you have to have, English, math, um, and then some classes from some different areas um, as well. And then for transfer, most campuses look for major prep. Um, so faculty at our campuses have said, if you want to transfer into this major, you've got to have so-and-so classes completed to get in. Um, so that's what major prep is, and each of the campuses have different major prep requirements per major. So I definitely encourage you to use assist.org, as well as for the University of California system, if you want to transfer, you can create a TAP account, which is a transfer admission planner to help you track your progress um, towards transferring. So these are the comprehensive review factors we look at for first year admission. Um, so we have the PIQs, the contextual factors, academic factors. I talked about those a little bit earlier as the 13 um, review factors. And we talked a little bit about what was mentioned on the screen. So there are some common pitfalls with the UC application um, that we see year over year students get a little confused. If you don't have a social security number, you don't need to fill out that section of the application. Um, so when you're asked for that information, you can just leave it blank. Um, so that's a common thing people usually have a question about. Household income. So people are usually a little worried about this. Um, just put down what is current to your situation. So um, if you are with one parent, if you're with a legal guardian, whatever your situation is, just answer the questions honestly. And this section of the application is not about your financial aid award. It's actually how you might qualify for a fee waiver. Um, so if you put in uh, your household income here and you're uh, below a, a threshold to qualify for an application fee waiver, uh, you can use it for four campuses. And at the end of the application, you wouldn't have to pay. So make sure you fill out your household income information accurately. Um, so you might be able to qualify for a, a University of California application fee waiver. We also have a lot of confusion sometimes over our majors and how to find a major on the application. I just really encourage you to do your research ahead of time to see what does UC San Diego call a major? What does UC Irvine call a major? Um, so that you can navigate this part of the application a little bit more easily. Um, so check out the campuses, see what you want to study, um, take note of what people call um, the majors, and you might have to even call us our campuses if you're not finding the exact major that you're looking for while you're filling out the application, uh, because you can look at it in major view or in department view as well. Um, so there's a few different ways to look at those. And then adding college classes. This is a common pitfall we see for people. So if you have all your high school coursework, that's great. You're going to say, I went to so-and-so high school and enter all your classes. 
And then if you did a community college class, you're going to say, I went to so-and-so community college and enter all your college classes. So you're going to enter them as separate entities. Um, so enter all your high school stuff under your high school, all your college stuff under your college. For some of the review factors, there's also activities and award section. Um, so you're going to put in work experience. I mean, there's so many things that you're doing outside of academics. Um, so maybe you translate for your family, maybe you do work, maybe you're a caregiver and um, help your siblings. Um, so these are all things we want to know about um, and things that make you you. Uh, then we are also looking within this section for community involvement. So make sure you write down those things, leadership and growth experiences. And please provide scope and context. And what we mean by that is you do have some characters. So tell me what leadership position you held. Tell me if you raised money for a certain organization or tell me how many hours a week you independently play on your guitar in your room. Um, there is so many uh, great things that you can put in this activities and award section. And then we have our personal insight questions. So these are really great um, for the application process for first year students. There are eight questions. And you choose four to answer. Uh, there's a minimum of a 350 word response uh, for each one. Well, that's actually the maximum. You can only do 350 words. Um, and then each question, there's no, there's no perfect question to answer. They're really about who you are. So as you answer them, uh, we really recommend for best practices that you use I statements. So I did this and I did that. That's why it's important to me. Um, you use specific examples. Um, one of the common mistakes we see people is using quotes. Um, so you only have 350 words. And when you use a quote, you're talking of, in someone else's words and not your own. And it can be really hard to have enough words to then talk about your experiences. Um, so make sure you are talking from your own personal experiences. You don't want to talk about you know, parents or guardians. Um, and they're really here to provide context about your situations. Um, so things you did at school, activities, um, hard things, fun things. Um, you might share some of the best things that have ever happened or some of the worst things that have ever happened. Um, but the PIQ, we'd say, is definitely for you and your unique story. It's not an English essay. Um, it's really about you and your story. And then the additional comment section on the application can really be used to provide a lot of context. Um, so there are two boxes for additional comments on the application. And I've read thousands, thousands and thousands and thousands of applications. And so the additional comments are really helpful. Um, so there's one after you enter all of your classes, and then there's another additional comments box after your PIQs. So in your academic section, additional comment box, you could share things about your academic journey that you want the campuses to know um, so that we can understand you in context. It's, it's not required, um, but you do have 550 characters there. Um, so what is context? You know, it is the frame that really surrounds your academic experience. So your academic experience is in the center of this, and there's a lot of things that happened around you, right? I mean, there was COVID, there was grading policies, there's different curriculums for every high school, perhaps, or maybe you studied internationally, and then you came to the United States. Maybe your school environment, maybe something specific happened. I remember when I was doing in-person visits and I visited a high school that didn't have a ceiling. They were doing construction and half the year these students were studying under no ceiling and, and they were cold. So it's these environmental factors as well, or maybe you had a non-traditional environment. Um, maybe you did do some homeschooling and then transition, um, or maybe you had a poor grade and you wanna kind of provide a little bit of context about why um, that happened. Maybe you had a concussion, maybe you had a, 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 an ailment or a certain situation with your family. Um, so any situation or circumstance experience that you haven't gotten to explain fully on the application, um, that's the additional comments that you can provide in the after the personal insight questions. Um, so these could be really anything that you didn't feel like you got to explain anywhere else on the application. So perhaps a learning disability, a personal or family circumstance. Uh, maybe you commute to school, you ride the bus three hours each way. Um, there are just situations that make it so that you can't, maybe you can't participate in after school activities. Maybe you couldn't afford to attend a California community college. Um, there are just so many different things that you might put 
in the additional comment section. Just don't use it to write another personal insight question or copy an English essay, and don't use it to put in a uh, resume. Um, really use it to provide context about who you are and your experiences. So these are some application resources that we have for you as well. Um, so I'll pop some of these links in the chat box um, for you. And um, now um, I think I'm ready to take a few questions um, from the chat. Uh, Lisa, were there any that came in? Yes, so there's actually two that are probably important in CrossBolt that we should cover. And one is about if you get a D or an F grade in a class and you retake it from an accredited source, is the new grade taken in the GPA calculation? So when you report all of your academic coursework, please um, put it in as you see it on your transcript. So don't admit any grades. Um, so if you took it, you did poorly, and then you're remediating it with a different course, uh, please put all of that information in um, to the context. And the 10th and 11th grade weighted GPA is going to be used um, for admission decisions. So make sure you put in both of those classes. Um, and uh, the 10th and 11th grade GPA is going to be used for consideration. I did want to mention as well, really briefly, that for CSU, the class that you repeat in order to cancel out the negative grade, it does need to be the exact same course. So if it's AP US history and you don't do well and you just retake regular history, then both grades get calculated into your GPA because it's a different course. But if you make up the exact same AP history class, then that will replace it. So just be cautious on those. Um, there's another question here that says, I took two years of language, however, I wanted to take a third year, but my school does not offer it. How should I stand out for the UCs? Okay, um, I'm looking at that question now. So two years of Spanish um, and then wanted to take French. Um, so there are different opportunities for students. I think if your school is not offering it and you want to reach out um, to maybe your California Community College and see if a course is being offered um, that you could take and uh, would be affordable for you, um, you could uh, do that. So you could try to take it through the California Community College. And since we're all online, there are so many California Community Colleges that offer so many classes that you could check that out. Um, and, and see where that lands. But, but really also we review applicants in the context of their high school. So not every school offers the same opportunities for students. Not every school offers a lot of AP courses or a lot of foreign language courses, even in that example. Um, so we also recognize during the application reading process that um, each school is different. And so we read in that school's context um, and each application for, the, uh, for us, at least at UC San Diego, is read two times in that academic context. So we're looking at the courses that are offered um, available to you. There's a question specific to your campus, Jessica, and it's, is UC San Diego test optional for class of 2022? So specifically for UC San Diego, uh, we have not uh, made a announcement yet. You can check our website um, for updates as they become more available. Um, there are some other UCs have already made announcements um, and I'm not gonna mention them by name uh, because I'd like you to, to independently research each, camp each campus to make sure that that content is accurate. Um, but there are some have, that have already made an announcement and the UCOP has not made an announcement yet for the whole system. Um, there was another question. I think we can both um, provide a, an answer for both campuses. It may be similar, but there was a question about if I take college classes during high school. Um, and so I did answer that one to say, as long as the college class is taken before graduation, then that's great. And you can submit it for course credit. And so the follow up to that is what if some of those college classes were used for your high school A through G's? Um, they can be, for instance, English, if you're taking um, an English 101 or you're taking, you know, pre-calculus, something at your community college instead of at your high school, that's perfectly fine. When you apply, you will report both. And so you'll have to include your um, college coursework taken, enter all your units, grades, et cetera, just like the high school, and then all of your high school coursework taken, and then they will be um, reviewed all together as long as it's before high school graduation, and then you'll need to submit both transcripts. 
So the one from the community college and then the one from your high school. I just wanted to mention with test scores for the University of California, um, there was a system-wide announcement um, right around the beginning of COVID that for fall 2022, all of our campuses were gonna be test optional. Um, so although UC has not made a determination that all of our campuses are gonna be test free for fall 2022, you can know that all the campuses are at least test optional for fall 2022 admission. And the 13 review factors, there's a lot more that goes into it than someone's test score. Um, it's not a single reason why someone would be admitted or not to a University of California campus. Well, we have a lot of questions coming in. Lisa, is there one that you were um, wanting to answer? Yeah. So I do have one in here, let me click this here, about what is the MFAS or the multi-factor admission score? Um, this is brand new this year. It's actually modeled off of Cal Poly SLOW's admission um, that they've been doing for many years, about 25 years or so. So they've always had this practice of taking additional applicant attributes. Um, we've adopted it across the system in place of test scores this year in order to have a different criteria to review and admit students. And so right now it'll be in place for this academic year, next academic year. After that, we don't know yet, but what it does is it combines your GPA with a list of attributes from your application. So extracurricular hours, work hours, um, things that you just answer in your application questions and it just generates a score that will give you similar to an eligibility index, a criteria where a campus can review and place you. And so that's how we'll admit per major or per area. And so again, every campus uses it differently. For example, Cal Poly Slow uses it per program. Um, at my campus, it's used for the impacted programs separately and then only based on freshman, local, out of local. So every campus will apply it differently, but we all use and generate the same score. So you'll have to check with each campus and just see, you know, is there an admission criteria cutoff for that one? Um, uh, but just know that it's coming from your application based on questions that you answer. There was another question about how, if you can apply for a double major. So technically when you're applying, you need to earn your first undergraduate major. And so apply to the program that you're interested in. Once you become a student and you're on that pathway, then yes, during campus, you know, during school, you can choose to add a secondary major, a minor, you can add both, you can do whatever combination that will help you in what you're trying to achieve. Um, but as you're entering as a freshman, as a first year student, choose your most critical major that you'd like to enter at, at that point. I saw a question come in about extracurriculars. Um, so students with the class of uh, 22, are they expected to be highly involved in extracurriculars? Um, so for the University of Al the, uh, California, um, the activities and awards section, you it, it can be so expansive. It doesn't have to be school-based activities. It can be outside of school activities. There's a lot of activities you probably do that you're not even thinking about um, that are going to um, show different parts of your personality. So uh, earlier, I think I mentioned music. You know, students might practice music independently. They might practice ceramics independently. Um, they might draw independently. So there's just a lot of things that make you you um, and personal circumstances that you can include on your application that aren't school-based activities. And um, also we all lived through this experience. We know how much the world changed in the last year. Um, so it's, it, there, it's very different. And we recognize that in the reading process that students didn't have the same opportunities that they might've um, had COVID and the pandemic not occurred. So I think we have time for maybe two more questions. And then I dropped my email in the chat box if anyone after the presentation has UC questions that are unanswered. Was there one you were looking at, Lisa? Um, there is one here. Let's see. So it says for the Cal State Apply website, what would your school district name be for Hawaii for registration? So go by search your high school name only. Don't do your district when you're going into the applicant field for your high school, just search your high school. And if it doesn't pop up because it's auto generated based on what the school enters, um, then you can manually type it in. 
So don't worry about that. If you can't find it on there, manually type it in. But if you can find it on the drop down list, then select from there. Someone was asking about for the UC application, do community college courses need to be counted as dual enrollment um, and, and be recognized by the high school? Um, so not necessarily because you might have taken community college classes independent. Um, you might have uh, used assist and found a UC transferable course that you wanted to take and enrolled. Um, so if you have any college classes, you just make sure on the UC application that you tell us that you have a college class and then enter it under that college um, to be considered um, for, for rigor uh, in that application process. And I think uh, Josh is, is letting us know that um, time is expiring. Uh, Lisa, do you have any final words or? Um, just a final word, make sure you connect with your campuses, connect early and often, use your counselors, the resource, really, you know, get the information that you need and, you know, reach out to us at the campuses. Everyone is willing and able to help. Um, so good luck through the process. If you need anything, please contact. Yeah, I would totally agree. Well, good luck in your application processes. Uh, Josh, uh, are you going to take us out? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, really, thank you to our panelists, Lisa and Jessica. Really appreciate um, all of the content you had to share with us this afternoon. And thank you to all of you for joining us. Um, when you close your window, there will be a link to just a very quick four question survey. We really appreciate any feedback that you can provide for us. Also, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is just one of many sessions being hosted today as part of the college fair. So we hope that you will uh, go online and sign up for others if you haven't already. And in about a week, you'll be able to find this and other sessions recordings online at that same website, strivescan.com slash WACAC. Um, so thanks again to everyone and enjoy the rest of your afternoon.